Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host Jeff Williams. We're here for our very first show in the year 2019. And of course, uh, we took a week off for Christmas and so we come back in and what do we do? We forgot how to actually do a show. That's why you had a couple of extra seconds of black space in there. But don't worry, we're here. We got the bugs worked out. Can't exactly say that for the federal government, but we'll get into that in a little bit later here. Uh, but what we are going to do in this uh, jam-packed, action-filled information overload is actually start with the weather. Uh, you, are you enjoying the warm weather out there? Yeah, I know it was just cold in the last couple of weeks, a little on the chilly side. Um, my feet froze the last couple of days, just crawling into bed. Uh, but we're in the 30s. We're going to hit to the 40s. Now, before you think that winter's over, because it's January. Oh, winter must be over. I heard that part of prognostication from a lot of people when we had a slight January thaw a year ago. Um, what is causing this? Is it global warming or is it just a natural phenomenon? Well, we're actually going to get into that because instead of starting off with our Prager University segment, we're actually going to start with meteorologist Joe Bastardi from weatherbell.com and he explains what is happening with the uh, current weather pattern and what we can expect to see in the next couple of months. Weather Battle Analytics meteorologist Joe Bastardi, your daily update. I hope everyone had a happy new year. Um, where is the cold weather? Now, we have a very severe winter period coming up in this forecast, mid-January on. And we've been touting this. And to be, to be frank about it, the entire winter forecast by Weather Bell rides on, does it get as severely cold as we think it's going to get? And I still think it's going to get. But where is it? Well, first of all, when we look at the upcoming 10 days, I'm going to show you a way it actually sneakily begins in the northeastern part of the United States. And the great late winters of uh, 2013 and 1969 both began on February 9th with major snowstorms in New York City. This year, it may be a month earlier. It may sneak into this area of the country first. Now, there's no question it's been very cold in this area of the country uh, over the past few days, but it's going to moderate. I'm going to show you why. Uh, this, is the, this is the surface weather map last night. We go to tonight, and this little area of low pressure is coming across. It would be a little bit of light snow in here, and we're going to get some snow in those areas that got hammered by thunderstorms. Uh, last week. So that southern folklore is going to work. And here you can see it snowing deep in the heart of Texas, uh, mainly the heaviest snow, southern Oklahoma and uh, northern Texas here. Always nice to see snow down in Texas. But what happens is all this low pressure and warm air floods Canada. See it? And so this low, a low coming out of the Gulf of the mid-Atlantic states would normally produce a big snowstorm in here. It's too much warm air. The warm air comes blasting across and erases the cold air. There's the low going. That's a sweet spot, the benchmark for a big I-95 snowstorm. No, too much low pressure. But the low pressure is sinking south. And what happens is uh, we get out here to, um, let's see, last night was uh, Tuesday night. Okay, Saturday night. This cold high starts sticking its nose into the northeast part of the United States. And so Sunday night, there's the cold high. And what happens is, because of this deepening low off the eastern seaboard, this storm comes up and then runs off to the south over here. And that may get things started. You can see what we look like Monday night. And uh, at this time, it may be snow and ice all the way down to the Mason-Dixon line, because instead of having a high over here and low pressure up here, like you're going to see uh, Friday, you have a high over here, and the pressures are lowering off to the east and south. And you see what the upper air pattern goes. You see, what's been going on is this. You see that arc of red? It's been, it's been like this for the last two weeks in front of these systems. But when it's to the west and north like this, cold air can feed into the system as the system's coming across. Now, this happened February 9th, uh, 2013. Very similar upper air pattern. Big storm developed along the eastern seaboard. And while this is not quite as strong, what we do see is that it does exit over here, and it has the capability of being a heck of a storm. And I'll show you why in just a moment. So it, we're, we're looking at this, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you get to next week at this time, there may be snow on the ground all over here in the northeast. Still mild, though, across much of the United States. 
Now, you see this Madden Julian oscillation on the European. See how it goes into phase eight over here? Well, the phase eight 500 millibar, well, first of all, it's in phase seven. Phase seven argues for the weather map you're seeing in about five, six days. Upper low here, something coming through here. Then phase eight argues that it deepens into the eastern part of the United States and the means. And so we, we look for a correction to try to take place here later, uh, maybe this weekend and next week. But the true cold waits. This is day 15 through 25 on the CFSV2. Here's 25 through 35, 35 through 45. Europe is going to get brutal. And what will happen is you remember how winter was called off last year. Remember, February, mid and latter part of February is two weeks of real warm weather. Ah, that's it, right? And March and April went wild. Well, this year, this year it's going to happen earlier. It'll happen mid and late January, probably right into March. That's what I believe is going to happen. And I believe that uh, you know all these things that we're seeing, the stratospheric warming going on, the strength of the Madden Julian oscillation, the Madoki type La Nina. Now we're getting to see that the Southern Oscillation Index is beginning to fall. All these things are falling into place. And by the way, some of these strat warm examples we've given you, uh, 1984, for instance, and what happened 30 days later in 85, and late December of uh, uh, 1965, and then what happened in January 66, and 93, 94. I mean, all these things, whenever you see that kind of stratospheric warming, and we've got it going, you have to say, look out, and I think we're going to have to look out. All right, we'll see. That's it for now. Enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got. In our country. So that's a little bit more as to what's going on. So essentially, about another week or two, we can expect to see a blast of really, really cold air, maybe last a week or two, and then it should actually get back to just a normal winter. Uh, Bastardi, we, we've, we play, I play Joe Bastardi stuff on occasion. I don't want to overdo it with Joe Bastardi. But at the same time, he has some valuable stuff. So every couple of months, I try to give you a little bit of a preview as to what's coming on for at least the rest of winter or what the uh, upcoming season's going to look like because he's usually correct. Um, the guy knows his stuff, and he predicted a year ago we were going to have a Madoki El Nino. A couple of months ago, I looked it up on those years that he uses as an analog. What the snowfall total is for the Twin Cities, and it's about 35 inches for the entire winter. Now, contrast with last year, and I think we had like 78 inches. So essentially, we're about half of the snow. Well, what happens this year so far? We had one major snowstorm. And you look at the snow banks, they're almost non-existent out there. And now we're getting into a warming phase for about a week, which is a good thing. Uh, so now by the time that this finishes, we won't have any snow banks or they're going to be extremely little, barely uh, noticeable. Uh, this is a Mendoki El Nino year and Joe Bastardi has said that many, many times and he is correct. This is a Mendoki El Nino and, and I, I watch his uh, daily updates and Saturday summaries just about every day uh, just so I can learn this stuff. He's a really good teacher. And consequently, I happen to know what's going on with the weather. And every now and then, I'll find one of these uh, daily updates that I really think that you might enjoy and learn from. And, and the one he had yesterday, which we just played, uh, I, I felt would uh, be a good indicator to get us through March, since we're now in the new year. Anyhow, one thing we did back in 2015, once the uh, 2016 presidential campaign started, we played um, a segment of a candidate's announcement, usually about five minutes worth, to give you unfettered access to what the new candidates have to say. And even though Donald Trump is the president right now, unlike in 2016 when we had an open seat for both parties, uh, you have an incumbent right now. And now you got the Democrats challenging. And we're going to do the same thing this year as we did in 2015. When candidate, serious candidates announce, we will play something about their opening. And already we have had one candidate on the Democratic Party who has announced. And so I give you Elizabeth Warren's announcement that she is starting an exploratory committee. In our country, if you work hard and play by the rules, you ought to be able to take care of yourself and the people you love. 
That's a fundamental promise of America, a promise that should be true for everyone. Growing up in Oklahoma, that promise came through for me and my family. After my older brothers joined the military and I was still just a kid, my daddy had a heart attack and couldn't work. My mom found a minimum wage job at Sears, and that job saved our house and our family. My daddy ended up as a janitor, but he raised a daughter who got to be a public school teacher, a law professor, and a senator. We got a real opportunity to build something. Working families today face a lot tougher path than my family did. And families of color face a path that is steeper and rockier, a path made even harder by the impact of generations of discrimination. I've spent my career getting to the bottom of why America's promise works for some families, but others who work just as hard slip through the cracks into disaster. And what I've found is terrifying. These aren't cracks that families are falling into, they're traps. America's middle class is under attack. How do we get here? Billionaires and big corporations decided they wanted more of the pie. And they enlisted politicians to cut them a fatter slice. They crippled unions so no one could stop We're them. We're going to turn the bull loose. Dismantled the financial rules meant to keep us safe after the Great Depression and cut their own taxes so they paid less than their secretaries and janitors. It's time to write the rules for the middle class. After Wall Street crashed our economy in 2008, I left the classroom to go to Washington and confront the broken system head on. Elizabeth Warren, apparently not afraid to tangle with Wall Street. Elizabeth Warren is heading into the lion's den. Mrs. Warren goes to Washington. She did. We created America's first consumer watchdog to hold the big banks accountable. A woman who has warned of another meltdown. If Washington doesn't straighten up. I never thought I'd run for office not in a million years. But when Republican senators tried to sabotage the reforms and run me out of town, I went back to Massachusetts and ran against one of them. And I beat him. And we are going to turn Washington back to the people. Who do we love? Warren! Who do we love? Warren! Who do we love? Warren! Today, corruption is poisoning our democracy. One. Politicians look the other way, while big insurance companies deny patients life-saving coverage, while big banks rip off consumers, and while big oil companies destroy this planet. Our government's supposed to work for all of us, but instead, it has become a tool for the wealthy and well-connected. The whole scam is propped up by an echo chamber of fear and hate designed to distract and divide us. Races. People who will do or say anything to hang on to power point the finger at anyone who looks, thinks, prays, or loves differently than they do. But this dark path doesn't have to be our future. We can make our democracy work for all of us. We can make our economy work for all of us. We can rebuild America's middle class, but this time, we gotta build it for everyone. No matter where you live in America, and no matter where your family came from in the world, you deserve a path to opportunity. Because no matter what our differences, most of us want the same thing, to be able to work hard, play by the same set of rules, and take care of the people we love. That's the America I'm fighting for. And that's why today I'm launching an exploratory committee for president. But the outcome of this election will depend on you. In the last two years, millions of people have done more than they ever thought they would to protect the promise of America. And here's what we learned. If we organize together, if we fight together, if we persist together, we can win. We can and we will. Okay, now I'm going to resist the urge of poking fun at Elizabeth Warren, but I'm also going to resist the urge of picking her four minute and 30 second video apart because uh, I could, I could take the entire hour. I'm not going to do that. Elizabeth Warren, uh, and I actually said this in 2015 about Donald Trump. Elizabeth Warren has something to say, just like Donald Trump had, to, had something to say. And Elizabeth Warren, like Donald Trump, is a serious candidate for president. I will treat her as such. Um, she's going to have a long road to hoe. There, she's just the first out of probably many candidates. I've even heard that Hillary Clinton might be looking at running again. 
Um, so it's going to be an interesting Democrat nomination process uh, simply because this can go anywhere. Um, I think that in all well, I guess let me back up for in my mind just a second here. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, Trump does this, Trump does that, oh, he'll get reelected automatically. Oh, it's, it, it, Trump's, Trump's got it in the bag. No matter what he does, he's got it in the bag. I've heard that. That's kind of what I thought back in 1991 when uh, George H.W. Bush had 91% approval rating during Operation Desert Storm. He lost his re-election bid. Uh, I kind of thought that uh, Mitt Romney could have knocked off Barack Obama. I really didn't think that anybody would see Barack Obama worthy of a second term. He got elected to a second term. When it comes down to the presidential race in 2020, it is going to be a Republican candidate, most likely Donald J. Trump, versus a Democrat candidate to be determined. That's it. When those two go head to head, that's what the country's gonna have to decide upon. So until then, we're just, as soon as a Democrat announces, or an independent announces, we'll roll with it. So I guess, welcome to the race, Elizabeth Warren. I promise you I will not pick, pick on you or make fun of you this week. But I'm sure that there will probably come a time within the next year or two that we'll uh, take a look at what you have to say a little closer in depth and uh, correct the record based upon historical and current facts. Anyhow, uh, we are now going to go to our... Prager University segment for today, and we are going to talk about the issue that has been going on for the, well, it's been going on for a while, uh, but really been in the news a lot for the last two weeks uh, since the government shutdown. And for this Prager University segment, we're going to go with the late Charles Krauthammer, and his segment is on how to solve illegal immigration, build the wall. Every sensible immigration policy has two objectives. One, to regain control of our borders so that we decide who enters. And two, to find a humane way to deal with the 11 million illegal immigrants who now live among us. Start with the second. For both practical and moral reasons, America cannot and will not and should not expel 11 million people. That leaves us with two choices. Ignore them or figure out a way to legalize them. Ignoring them hasn't worked. But there's also a huge problem with legalization. It creates an irresistible incentive for new illegal immigrants to come. We say, of course, that this would be the very last, very final, never again, we're not kidding this time, amnesty. And everyone knows it's phony. That's what was said in 1986 when we passed the Simpson-Mazzoli immigration reform, it turned out to be the largest legalization program in American history. Nearly three million people got permanent residency. There was no enforcement. We now have 11 million new illegal immigrants in our midst. The irony of this whole debate, which bitterly splits the country, is that there is a silver bullet that would not just solve the problem, but also create a national consensus behind it. A vast number of Americans who oppose legalization and fear new waves of immigration would change their minds if we could radically reduce new, i.e. future, illegal immigration. And we can. First, build a barrier. Call it a wall, call it a fence, call it what you will. Add cameras and sensors, add drones, beef up the patrols, all that matters is that we regain control of the border. Fences work. The triple fence outside San Diego led to a 90% reduction in infiltration. Israel's border fence with the West Bank produced a similar decline. Even holier-than-thou Europeans 
have conceded the point. Hungary, Macedonia, Bulgaria, Austria, Greece, Spain, why even Norway have all started building border fences to stem the tide of Middle Eastern refugees. Then in force, two other measures, a national e-verify system that makes it just about impossible to work if you are here illegally, and a functioning visa tracking system since 40% of illegal immigrants are visa overstays. The wall fence will, of course, be ugly. So are the concrete barriers to keep truck bombs from driving into the White House. Sometimes function has to supersede form. And don't tell me that this is our Berlin Wall. When you build a wall to keep people in, that's a prison. When you build a wall to keep people out, that's an expression of sovereignty. Of course, no barrier will be foolproof, but it doesn't have to be. It simply has to reduce the river to a manageable trickle. Once we do, everything becomes possible, including dealing with our 11 million illegal immigrants. So let's fix that. Track the visas, do we verify, build the damn barrier. It's ridiculous to say that it can't be done. And who would certify that the border is back in our control? I would have a neutral party, perhaps a commission of retired jurists, issue the judgment. Once they do, we legalize the 11 million, granting them the right to stay and work here. We can't give them citizenship. That's a bridge too far. You don't get to join the political destiny of the country by entering it illegally. But any children born here would be American, which means that over time, the issue resolves itself. The American people are legitimately angry at the price American society has paid due to illegal immigration. But they are also a generous people. Once they're assured that we do indeed control our borders, that anger will abate. A national consensus will emerge. Radical border control followed by radical legalization. No mushy compromise. A solution requires two acts of national will. Putting up a wall along with E-Verify and visa tracking and absorbing those who broke our laws to come to America. This is not a compromise meant to appease both sides without achieving anything. It's not some piece of hybrid legislation that arbitrarily divides illegals into those with five-year-old roots in America and those without or some such mischief-making nonsense. If we do it right, not only will we solve the problem, we will get it done as one nation. I'm Charles Krauthammer for Prager University. So that is a pragmatic solution to a long-standing problem. Now you know a little bit more as to why. Charles Krauthammer said, do we have the will to do it? Apparently, right now, we don't necessarily have the political will. And political will, mind you. I think this is actually something Republicans and Democrats agree on, if taken out of the political arena. But right now, it's in the political arena. It is a big driver of policy in Washington. Highlight this from December 21st. This is uh, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell, the Senate leadership, talking about the border wall and government shutdown. President Trump, you will not get your wall. Abandon your shutdown strategy. You're not getting the wall today, next week, or on January 3rd when Democrats take control of the House. No Democrat has called for shutting the government down. We are all working to avoid it. The President seems to relish it. He seems to feel it'll throw a bone to his base. The problem being, his base is less than one quarter of America. Mr. President, President Trump, you cannot erase months of video of you saying that you wanted a shutdown and that you wanted the responsibility and blame for a shutdown. President Trump, you own the shutdown. There's no sharp distinction between the proposal my friends across the aisle have decided to oppose today and proposals they've been happy to endorse in the past. 
<clears throat> the only thing that's really changed are the political winds way over, way over on the far left. That's what's changed. So let's not end this year the way we began it, with another shutdown over the issue of illegal immigration. Remember this back in January? All because the Democrats are unwilling to support common sense measures to address it. Let's advance this legislation, Mr. President. Let's pass it. Let's finish our work for this year. Let's secure our country. So we need border security. So now what did President Trump have to say regarding the showdown on Capitol Hill um, on December 21st? Democrats as to whether or not we have a shutdown. Uh, it's possible that we'll have a shutdown. I would say the chances are probably very good because I don't think Democrats care so much about maybe this issue, but this is a very big issue. It's an issue of crime. It's an issue of safety. It's an issue of, of uh, least importantly, dollars. They've devoted their lives to making sure it doesn't happen. And that wasn't for what should happen. That was for political reasons. So uh, we are going to be working very hard to get something passed in the Senate. There's a very good chance it won't get passed. It's up to the Democrats. So it's really the Democrat shutdown, because we've done our thing. When Nancy Pelosi said, you'll never get the votes in the House, we got them, and we got them by a big margin. Now it's up to the Democrats as to whether or not we have a shutdown tonight. I hope we don't, but we're totally prepared for a very long shutdown. And this is our only chance that we'll ever have, in our opinion, because of of the world and the way it breaks out uh, to get great border security. We are going to, one way or the other, we're going to get a wall, we're going to get uh, a barrier, we're going to get anything you want to name it. You can name it anything you want. But we cannot let what's been going on in this country over the last 10 years, we just can't let it happen. So that's what President Trump said just before the Senate was unable to pass the House bill, and we have a partial government shutdown. I remember back in 1995, 1996, somewhere in there, back when uh, Bill Clinton, Newt Gingrich, Dick Armey and company all had the same type of showdown over government spending. And we had a government shutdown. Nothing happened. Non-essential federal employees would be sent home. Oh, but as soon as they got called back to work, they got back pay. So they had an unpaid vacation, but then they got everything restored. That's our government shutdown today. According to Rasmussen reports, and I'm just looking at it here, vo uh, voters worry about the economic impact of a parcel shutdown although only 12% say past shutdowns have had a major impact on their lives. That's your government shutdown. So then by Christmas Day, uh, President Trump was on a conference call, Skype, whatever, video conference, with um, military members. I'm not sure exactly where they were based, but let's take a look at the video where he brought up the uh, border wall. On behalf of the soldiers, family members, and contractors of Task Force Talent, we wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays from the tropical U.S. territory of Guam. Well, it's all, I call it bells and whistles, but if you don't have the wall, it doesn't work. With the icebreakers, you need a lot of steel. Well, I want to wish everybody a really Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year. Uh, just remember, the people in our country, we're very proud of you. The country's doing well. We have a little bit of a shutdown because we believe in walls and we believe in borders and we believe in barriers and, you know, we have a special country. People have to come in through the legal process, not just walk in. We have no idea who they are. And we're stopping drugs at a record rate, but we need some help, and the help is the wall. We need a wall to help us. We had caravans of people coming up, you've been seeing it, and we stopped them. We stopped them cold and they're heading back. For the most part, they're heading back or they're staying in Mexico. But I will, uh, I will tell you, I know the work you do, and uh, it's been amazing, and it's great. I will see you all. I know I'll meet you all. I'll see you all. 
But on behalf of the country, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, keep doing the job. We're all very proud of you. Nobody can do what you do. I can't tell you when the government's going to be open. I can tell you it's not going to be open until we have a wall, a fence, whatever they'd like to call it. I'll call it whatever they want. But it's all the same thing. It's a barrier from people pouring into our company, into our country from drugs. Well, uh, that was on Christmas. Now, sometime after that, something else happened. See, the Democrats and the media were complaining that Donald Trump hadn't visited the troops. Donald Trump didn't visit the troops. Donald Trump didn't visit the troops. Donald Trump didn't visit the troops. That was what we heard throughout the majority of the month of December, or at least Christmas week. So Donald Trump went out and visited the troops. Here he is. Uh, he was uh, three and a half hours on the ground visiting troops in Iraq. Perfect. Back into the military, into the army because of me. And I'm here because of you. So we have something in common. Thank you, man. That is some great spirit. Everybody says that we have a right? The other reason I'm here today is to personally thank you and every service member throughout this region for the near elimination of the ISIS territorial caliphate in Iraq and in Syria. Two years ago, when I became president, they were a very dominant group. They were very dominant. Today, they're not so dominant anymore. Great job. I looked at a map, and two years ago, it was a lot of red all over that map. And now you have a couple little spots, and that's happening very quickly. That's happening very quickly. You'll be seeing that. I want to just say great job. And we'll be watching ISIS very closely in mind. We came to Al-Assad to share our eternal gratitude for everything you do to keep America safe, strong, and free. I'm getting ready. To so, of course, now the, now the Democrats are complaining because Donald Trump took selfies with troops and he signed hats. That's what they're complaining about. Except when Hillary Clinton visited Iraq back in November of 2003, in Kirkuk, Iraq, didn't have a problem having her photo taken with troops. Oh, sure, she may have just been a U.S. senator then, but everybody knew she was aspiring to become the president of the United States. So I didn't hear any Democrat outrage, outrage uh, then. Not when U.S. Senator from Rhode Island, uh, Jack Reed, was sitting there at the next table over at lunch. How can I tell you this? Because I was there. 
and I'm the one who took hundreds of photos of Hillary Clinton with our troops so they could email them home to their families. I didn't hear the Democrats speak too loudly of that, and I didn't hear any of them complain about my work because I was public affairs, and my job was to take photos of the distinguished guests, the distinguished visitors, and the troops. That was my job. It did not matter what political party the DV was from, Republican or Democrat, I had to treat them equal. The fact is, if there is an entertainer or a politician, my job was to take photos of our troops with them. So our people, you know, our military people, could send these back home to their families. I didn't hear the Democrats complaining back when Hillary Clinton was doing that in 2003. I didn't hear the Democrats complaining when Barack Obama was signing hats. I didn't hear them complaining too loudly when I saw military members at my old unit treating Barack Obama like a rock star and he was shaking hands and uh, signing things while military members were losing their military bearing. I was actually offended at my fellow Air Force and Army colleagues because as a military member, there's a certain bearing that we're supposed to have at all times. And they didn't have it. I couldn't chastise the commander-in-chief for that. If that's the way he wants to come out, hey, it's his choice. And I couldn't criticize Barack Obama for it any more than I can criticize President Trump, because he's the president. But I'd like to actually see some even-handedness from the Democratic Party and their, their uh, cohorts in the mainstream media that if you're going to criticize a Republican for doing something, you better criticize it when, Democratic, when a Democrat does it too. And I haven't seen too much of that. It's all Republicans, the Republicans, Republicans, Republicans are bad, 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 bad. That's what I hear from the Democrats, because they play to win. So they criticize President Trump for not making a trip to visit the troops. He makes a trip to visit the troops. Then they criticize him for that. The beauty of it is the troops actually love him, and they have tremendous respect for him. And that is one of the things that makes me proud as a veteran is that they can still have a great amount of respect for the office of the president and sometimes even for the man. Anyhow, uh, let's contrast that with a federal employee who was complaining. I'm getting ready to mobilize, to deploy to the California wildfire emergency response flying out actually tomorrow. And it is uncertain as to whether or not paychecks will be processed on time. It is also uncertain as to what the support might be that we need from people who are not considered essential. My understanding is that by the end of this week, we should get another email telling us we are indeed being furloughed or if something happens that a budget does get passed by the end of this week that does get signed by the president, then we know we are good to come back to work on Monday of next week. So, but given that one of the houses is not even in session right now, it is, it continues to be very nerve wracking, very uncertain. It's, it's just a, a deep frustration on the part of myself and many other federal employees that we just want to do our jobs. We just want to wake up like everybody else every morning, get up, go do our job. And especially because we have also this added commitment to the mission of the agencies that we serve, to serve the public, to provide clean air, clean water, and protect the health of people in the United States. So it is very frustrating when there is a shutdown and instead we get up every morning to a furlough and not being able to go to work. Okay. 1995 and 95-96 shutdowns. Uh, government workers were furloughed and non-essential services suspended during November 14th to 19th, 1995. 
And from December 16th, 1995 to January 6th, 1996, for a total of 27 days. The first of the two shutdowns caused the furlough of about 800,000 workers, while the second caused about 284,000 workers to be furloughed. 2013 shutdown lasted 16 days beginning on Tuesday, October 1st. The shutdown, approximately 800,000 federal employees were furloughed for 16 days, while another 1.3 million were required to report to work uh, without known payment dates. The deadlock centered on uh, continuing resolution. Um, the first shutdown of 2018 began at midnight on Saturday, January 20th. On January 19th, a bill failed to pass the U.S. Senate 50 to 49, with the majority of Democrats voting no. Five Republicans voted no, and five Democrats voted yes in the Republican majority Senate. Sixty votes were required for passage. Senate Democrats insisted that the issue of immigration, specifically the funding of DACA, be addressed in the budget. Republicans refused to include the issue, saying the deadline for DACA and immigration was not until mid-March. A stopgap that would fund the government for four weeks passed the House of Representatives, and Republican Senator Mitch McConnell proposed a three-week stopgap. The government reopened on Tuesday, January 23rd. That was, what, a two-day, a three, two three-day shutdown? Uh, then another one in f um, February, uh, looking here, approximately 11 p.m. Eastern on February 8th, the Senate recessed until 12.01 a.m., uh, effectively triggering a shutdown, and then uh, about 9 a.m., the bill was signed, so that pretty much had eliminated that. So while I have a AFGE government union official complaining about a government shutdown, he's been around, and I can tell by his age and by his tenure he'd been around in 1995. So government employees are furloughed. If you don't like it, get in the private sector. Just put your, just put your resignation out there and say, I don't want to deal with this uncertainty because we've been here so many times before. I'm going to do what's best for my family and I am going to get into the private sector. You don't have to work for the government. You're going to complain about, oh, we may not get paid. Well, you kind of knew that. Government shutdowns and furloughs are not new things. We've been dealing with this for almost 30 years. And, of course, I'm only giving you the most recent ones. Um, there was a government shutdown, I mean, 1980, 81, 84, 86, and 1990. I don't even touch those because those are even further back history. But for our federal employees who are complaining about the government shutdown, 95, 96, 2013, 2018, now 2019. We've been here before, folks. Government services. Don't stop. Sir, some of them do. We're experiencing some of the national parks kind of getting ravaged by tourists. Okay. Maybe the Democrats ought to have passed that particular bill funding the Department of the Interior. The House passed it. How come, well, the House passed it. How come Chuck Schumer couldn't deliver enough votes to authorize that one? So don't give me the song and dance, oh, well, we don't know, we're great public servants. You guys are making more than your counterparts in the private sector. Don't give me that crap. So, you know, while you have the Democrats complaining that Trump is not going to visit the troops in Iraq, he goes to visit the troops in Iraq, then you have the federal government union complaining because, oh, we're on furlough during the holidays. See, Trump is damned if he do, and he's damned if he doesn't. But one thing he is not going to do, and he said this yesterday, January 2nd, he is not, he's going to stand by his demand for a complete wall at the border. This is what he said. Every day, Border Patrol encounters roughly 2,000 illegal immigrants. I have to talk about this trying to enter our country, 2,000 a day, and that's a minimum. 
Every week, 300 Americans are killed by heroin, the vast majority of which comes across through our southern border. Our th southern border is like a sieve. It just pours through our southern border. And unless we're going to have physical barriers, it's never going to be able to be stopped. Too much money is being made. We have a very tough border. I think you see that even last night, where people charged the border, tried to get through, but they couldn't because we have a wall up. And uh, but tear gas was flying, and a lot of things were happening. And I guess, uh, for the most part, you've seen it. It's very sad. If they knew they had a physical barrier, if they knew they had a wall, if they knew they had something that's going to stop them, they would have never come up in the first place. We're in uh, the shutdown because of the fact that the Democrats are looking to 2020. They think they're not going to win the election. I guess a lot of signs point to the fact that they're not going to win the election. I hope they're not going to win the election. But they view this as an election point for them. I actually think it's bad politics, but I'm not thinking about the politics. I'm thinking about what's right and what's wrong. And we need a physical barrier. So they met the House and Senate leadership and President Trump. They met yesterday. What happened? Well, here's the rundown. Good afternoon, everyone. We have given the Republicans a chance to take yes for an answer. We have taken their proposals unamended by any House bipartisan uh, amendments, but, but just staying true to what the Senate has already done. Our question to the President and to the Republicans is, why don't you accept what you have already done to open up government? And that enables us to have 30 days to negotiate for border security. So the bottom line is very simple. We asked the president to support the bills that we support that will open up government. We asked him to give us one good reason. I asked him directly. I said, Mr. President, give me one good reason why you should continue your shutdown of the, of the eight cabinet departments while we are debating our differences on homeland security. He could not give a good answer. They are now feeling the heat. It is not helping the president. It is not helping the Republicans to be the owners of this shutdown. Today, we gave them an opportunity to get out of that and open up the government as we debate border security. And to say to them, because he says he won't sign it and use the government as hostage, we should just give in. The American people don't want that. That's bad for our country, and that's not the way to govern. Uh, we had a long discussion. The president asked us to come back on Friday after the leadership races. I think that was a concern for some people to be able to get through. We never did get through the complete briefing from the Secretary of Homeland, which we were concerned about because we do have a crisis on the border right now. Um, we had a violent mob rush yesterday where we had a challenge there. But we know that we have a challenge along the border. We want to solve that issue. We want to make sure we open this government up. And I think at the end of the day, the president listening to him, he wants to solve this as well. That's why he's asked us to come back Friday after uh, the leadership races to try to get this all done. Well, it doesn't have to last much longer at all. I, I think we can come to an agreement rather quickly. Um, I know that's why the president thought maybe after the leadership races, we'd, people would be more willing to come to an agreement. Of course. They're so that was the result of yesterday's meeting. And then this morning, uh, the, of course, we heard from Chuck Schumer about their proposal to keep the government open and we'll deal with the other issue that is preventing this uh, at another time. First, before I get into what happened this morning, uh, let's go back a year. Um, on January 23rd, 2018, uh, and the whole thing about DACA, uh, this is the Trump, uh, the, the Trump tweet. Crying Chuck Schumer fully understands, especially after his humiliating defeat, that if there is no wall, there is no DACA. We must have safety and security together with a strong military for our great people. That was Trump's statement a year ago. And the, 
Uh, Tuesday's tweet came after Schumer, the Senate Minority Leader, informed the White House that he is withdrawing an offer made during the, la during the heat of funding negotiations. In it, he agreed to support more than $1.6 billion for construction of the wall al along the southern border with Mexico. But, Schumer told uh, reporters on Tuesday, that offer made Friday was contingent on striking a more comprehensive deal that included DACA, a deal that has not materialized. Well, Chuck Schumer has it in him to agree to $1.6 billion funding for the wall. He had $1.6 billion on the table last year. See, here's what you're seeing. You're seeing Donald Trump playing the same game as the Democrats. And they don't like it. You know, I, I thought in that clip that Chuck Schumer was about to cry. He's not getting his way. The Democrats are so used to controlling the issue and Republicans caving in, they win. End of story. Move on to the next crisis. Donald Trump comes in and says, oh, you're going to give me my wall. I'll shut the government down. I'll, I'll, I'll take the credit for it or the blame. You're going to give me my wall. Well, here we are. Uh, almost two weeks in, you got the uh, federal government union official crying because he doesn't know when people are getting paid. You got Chuck Schumer who's demanding that the president get along with them, but they're not willing to offer anything in return. So now what does his colleague uh, in the Senate, uh, Mitch McConnell, have to say? This is what Mitch McConnell had to say this morning. Clip 11. Of course, there is urgent business that the new House <clears throat> and the new Senate will need to tackle immediately. Democrats will have to get finally serious about border security so that a government funding agreement can be reached, we can pass the House, earn 60 votes in the Senate, and get a presidential signature. All three of those things are needed to make a law. One partisan vote in the House tomorrow is not going to solve anything. I made it clear to the Speaker we're not interested in having show votes here in the Senate. We're interested in bringing up something that the House has passed, 60 senators will support, and the President will sign. The legislation that House Democrats are reporting, uh, reportedly planning <clears throat> to introduce and be voted on tomorrow will not be a serious contribution to the negotiations that are going on between the administration and the incoming Democratic majority in the House. It isn't comprehensive. It ignores the needs of border security. It's exactly the kind of proposal you'd expect if the incoming House Democrats were choosing to stage a political sideshow rather than doing the hard work of helping to govern the country. In other words, a total non-starter. And then from this morning, Let's take a look at the White House response. It doesn't, it doesn't reopen the government for homeland security. How in the world can we talk about funding the federal government and omit homeland security, which it keeps, keeps us all safe? Uh, Kristen, this president ran on and will continue to govern on border security. Uh, you can say wall all you want. You can make it a four-letter word. Nancy Pelosi can ignore. Yesterday, they just ignored and interrupted and was frankly, were frankly just very rude and dismissive of our Secretary of Homeland Security, our Director of Customs and Border Patrol, our Director of Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. If we're going to talk about bipartisanship and a, a democracy, a Washington that works, you just can't ignore the facts and the figures that somebody are trying to present to you that's coming from your own government. Government. So that was that was um, really poor form, but the president has graciously invited them back here tomorrow, and uh, hopefully they'll come recognizing that border security is not a partisan issue. It's a nonpartisan issue, starving for bipartisan solutions. But um, as I he heard the president say in the cabinet room yesterday, $54 billion or so in the Pelosi bill for foreign aid and nothing for border security? That just makes no sense. It makes no sense to Americans who know border security is national security. So there we have it. We're still at the stalemate. Now, something also uh, very important happened today, and that was the opening of 
the 116th Congress. Yes, Congress is back in session, and yes, the Democrats have control of the U.S. House of Representatives. So let's take a look at the swearing-in. Well, despite day 13 now of the government shutdown, it's an historic day in our nation's capital where we're looking live on a Thursday morning. The 116th Congress will be fully sworn in and getting to work in about two hours from now. Democrats seizing control of the House, fresh voices, fresh energy as the Democrats prepare to take on Donald Trump in this new 116th Congress. There is a record number of women, first Native Americans, first Muslims. Some of the highlights you're going to see today. Ilhan Omar, a Democrat from Minnesota, the first of two Muslim women elected to Congress. First ever, Rashida Tlaib, also one of those two. The first Muslim American, she's a Democrat as well. Also this one from Minnesota, Michigan, rather. You're also going to see the youngest person ever to be sworn in into Congress. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a Democrat from New York, just 29 years old, a 30-year-old woman woman is in Iowa, also a first in Mississippi. Republican Cindy Hyde Smith is the first female Republican ever to be elected to Congress from Mississippi. If you want to sound smart today, here is how the new Congress breaks down in the House. It's 235 Democrats to 199 Republicans and in the Senate it's 53 to 47 Republicans still seize control there. On Twitter this morning, some really heartwarming touching tweets from a lot of these new co co uh, congressional leaders. Dan Crenshaw, a Republican from Texas, you saw him on Saturday Night Live talking about the future of America with this great picture here. Also, Ilan Omar, as I mentioned, she's the first Muslim American to be serving. She says, 23 years ago, from a refugee camp in Kenya, my father and I arrived at an airport in Washington, D.C. Today, we returned to that same airport, this time to be sworn into Congress. I love that tweet. That's a good one. Me back. What a great story. Yes. Thanks, Jake. Okay, I'm going to correct his record for just a second. Uh, Cortez, uh, Ocasio Cortez is not the youngest person elected to Congress, maybe for the 116th Congress, but not ever in history. That still belongs to William Charles Cole Claiborne of Tennessee. He was the younger person, youngest person ever elected to the House of Representatives, born in Sussex County, Virginia in 1775. He was first elected at the age of 22, younger than the constitutionally required age of 25. But the House chose to seat him in uh, the 5th Congress, 1797 to 1799. Um, he also won election to the 6th Congress at age 24. Uh, the House also had uh, seated him then. And then when he actually became eligible, uh, he decided not to um, seek a third term. And then President Thomas Jefferson appointed him governor of the territory of Mississippi, and he later served as governor of the Orleans Territory and as governor of Louisiana. So he is the youngest person ever elected to Congress and has was seated, and he served two terms, and I don't think anybody younger than William Charles Cole Claiborne will ever become a member of Congress. So now let's take a look at the opening of the 116th Congress. Where's the oath? Okay, here it is. Will you all please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on what you, which you are about to enter, so help you God. Congratulations, you are now. And? We're out of time. So for Dallas Pearson producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis. Happy New Year. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next week.